welcome you all to the second session of this year's concert lectures with Professor Stephen Williams, who has come all the way from Northern Ireland. He's Professor of Theology at uh, Union University in Belfast. I'm particularly happy he's come because when I was in Scotland, he was one of my very few go-to theologians at the Dogmatics Conference I organized several times. So thank you for coming further. Uh, for those, I want to give a special welcome to the contingent from Wheaton College. So, I, and for their sake, I'll do a little summation, very short of what for me were a few of the many highlights from last night. Professor Williams reminded us of a book, I think it was published by Zondervan, Five Views on Predestination. And what was striking, he said, was how each position claims clear biblical support for its view. He wondered, how do we account for the differences? Might hermeneutics do it? Perhaps, but the deeper suggestion would be there are differences in the doctrine of God. There are different portraits of God, different paint-by-number pictures that have assigned different weights to different divine attributes, such as power, love, glory, and justice. That's the problem and it's been around for a while. Enter the systematic theologian, and I'm going to paraphrase your description. The systematic theologian, a, a lamentable creature whose reach exceeds his grasp, whose responsibility outdistances his competence. He is dependent on the Bible as his foundation, yet he lacks the exegete's mastery of the language, textual intricacies, and historical backgrounds. He can only aspire to the analytic rigor of philosophers, Historians shake their head in dismay at his hasty generalizations, and long-suffering social scientists wait for him to say something relevant. <laughs> but not this systematic theologian. With Professor Williams, we're in the hands of a master, not in the sense of one who has mastered divinity, but one who knows how to listen to scripture, when to speak, what to say when rightly dividing the word of truth. Methinks we're witnessing systematic theology in a strange new canonical key. Encore. Well, thank you, Kev Kevin. I'm going to sit down now so that you can tell me what I'm about to say. Is that all right? <laughs> I understand that uh, some of you may have come here uh, in the expectation that I'm going to talk about Bart and Mozart and Brahms, uh, so I understand. Now, uh, this may be my fault. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to talk about Bart, and Mozart will come into it at the end. But when, uh, when Kevin Van Hooser uh, contacted me perhaps about a year ago or so, I indicated that I thought I might take this angle on Bart, but it was provisional. I, sh I should have underlined the provisionality of that thought because I decided not to. Uh, and therefore, if any of you come hoping for Beethoven, Brahms, Mozart, I'm sorry I'm going to disappoint you. Uh, but a word will be said about Mozart towards the end. Indeed, the name of Beethoven will be mentioned. Indeed, the name of Brahms. In fact, as I say these things, I get, get excited about it and throw aside my script and begin talking about it. Did you predict that one coming? Okay, well, now to put the time to best use, uh, let's get down to this, uh, Bart on election. In days of old, before the dinosaurs roamed, earthlings used to pick up their pens to write a lecture. It remains to be seen exactly what the habit of computer composition following the mediating age of the typewriter has done to authorial psychology. But it is hard to believe that many who picked up their pens to write about Karl Barth ever did so dispassionately, even as mellow middle age passed into the twilight years of their lives, unless they were endowed with a double portion of a serene Buddhistic spirit. However, reading sober and well-informed commentators on Karl Barth compels us to tutor our emotions rather carefully. George Hunsinger, perhaps unexcelled amongst contemporary Bart commentators, certainly in the English-speaking world, remarked in the 90s that, 
we are still in the early stages of even understanding what it was that Barth had to say. And the 18 or so years which have elapsed since he said that have not made the judgment passé. Another distinguished commentator, once reputed to be potentially Barth's Elisha, went so far as to say that it will take many generations, if not centuries, to evaluate his service adequately. That's Tom Torrance. Hunsinger granted that it would be hard to deny all truth to that remark. Anyone disposed to take seriously those judgments without at the same time being disposed to gear a life's work to essaying an interpretative breakthrough will tone down expository self-expectations and aim to describe Bart not an sich as he is, but only as he appears. A very recent review of a volume on Bart welcomes the fact that its author has gone beyond the internecine battles among Bart scholars. But not everyone has gone beyond them. And no recent or current battle has had a higher profile than the battle fought over Bart's understanding of election against its background in his thought. If in a given issue the battle is or was not being fought in the International Journal of Systematic Theology, you could change channel and watch it in Scottish Journal of Theology. And even a major journal less regularly oriented to traditional problems in dogmatics, that is modern theology, has carried its contribution to the debate. The opening salvo in this particular engagement was fired by Bruce McCormack in an essay for the Cambridge Companion to Karl Barth and titled Grace and Being, the Role of God's Gracious Election in Karl Barth's Theological Ontology. The very title of the essay, when you compare it with the titles of the other essays in this volume, announces its author's determination to strike out on a definite line of interpretation. I quote Bruce McCormack's opening words. When the history of theology in the 20th century is written from the vantage point of, let us say, 100 years from now, I am confident that the greatest contribution of Karl Barth to the development of church doctrine will be located in his doctrine of election. Barth forges a new ontology, actualistic rather than essentialist. Being resides in act. He refuses the classical belief that the identity of God as Trinity is constituted independently of any decision to become incarnate. On the contrary, God's very self-constitution is with a view to subsequent incarnation. The word is who he is in eternal self-determination to become incarnate. But he's incarnate for us and for our salvation. Thus, God's elevation of humankind in the word is not a contingency, but complicit in God's eternal self-constitution. Bruce McCormack doubts if Bart is consistent here. His treatment of the Trinity offered in Church Dogmatics 1.1, before arriving at election in 2.2, needs revision in order to be brought into line with this actualism. It is the latter discussion that constitutes the novelty and heart of Barth's doctrine of election. I quote directly again from Bruce McCormack, election is the event in God's life in which he assigns to himself the being he will have for all eternity. Thus, God becomes knowable. In truly, truly noble in Jesus Christ. Quotation again. Knowing God in this way, we can trust that the love and mercy toward the whole human race demonstrated in Jesus' subjection of himself to death on the cross is essential to God and that election is universal in scope. A substantial response was given in Molnar's full-length study of divine freedom and the doctrine of the imminent trinity. Molnar both interpreted Barth's doctrine of God along more classical lines than did McCormack and rejected the proposal of a hiatus between 1.1 and 2.2. On his account, McCormack overlooks or misinterprets the place of the logos or sarkos, the discarnate word, in Barth's theology. And, and I'm quoting Molnar now, McCormack is misled into believing that God became the triune God only by virtue of his self-determination to be our God, end quote. And then, of course, the strife was well and truly on. 
with others joining in, Bruce McCormack himself returning to the fray in print in due course. I do not intend to pursue the question of the consistency or otherwise of statements across the first four half volumes of Church Dogmatics. What no one doubts is that there is certainly a strong actualism in Church Dogmatics from the beginning, even if some will make more than others of those statements which appear to modify it. He, that is God, is his self-revealing. He himself is not just himself, but also what he creates and achieves in man. These are statements from 1.1. God is an event or act. God's being is the event of God's act. God is his own decision. So we read when the doctrine of God is treated in 2.1. The actualism is wide and stark. Listen to this from Bart in 1.2. My neighbor is an event which takes place in the existence of a definite man, definitely marked off from all other men. Bart's language there, of course, in translation. As for the mccormack molnar exchange in particular, a protagonist in the debate was quick and right to point out that there are statements by Bart which can be taken as favoring either interpretation. The hermeneutical task in relation to Bart has to be undertaken with a steady eye on the nature of his rhetoric. Rhetoric is an enduring and dominant feature of a communicative homiletic style in church dogmatics. But Bard is also rhetorical in the narrower, ordinary sense of the word, as it applies to a particular word, phrase, or passage. And in those instances, you have to ask whether it is a sentence that Bard could have done without, or whether it reveals something rather vital. If you take a deep breath after his treatment of election, and wonder whether the best way to understand its force is by understanding its implications for Christian ethics, and so proceed to read straight on in his accompanying discussion of the command of God in 2.2, you pretty well immediately encounter what looks like a non sequitur. Quote, God is not known completely, and therefore not at all, if he is not known as the maker and lord of this covenant between himself and man rhetoric of negligible hermeneutical weight or deeply significant of what Bart has been getting at in the treatment of election. Two pages on from that, after we have been soaked for several hundred pages in the claim that all humans are elect willy-nilly, Bart tells us as he, man, measures himself against God, he necessarily judges himself. Unless he accepts this question, however it is to be answered, he obviously cannot be elect. What are we to make of that? Bart announced at the beginning of his treatment of God in 2.1, God is. In seeking to develop this statement, we confront the hardest and at the same time the most extensive task of church dogmatics. Adding, behind which there lies also concealed the hardest and at the same time, the most extensive task of the whole of Christian preaching. Actually, already in 1914, Bart had said that, I quote him again, the little clause, God is, signifies a revolution. Our question must be, what does Bart want to say? Yet again, I do not want to join in the effort to offer a definitive interpretation of the doctrine of God in 2.2 itself. If Bart's statements are to be taken as Bruce McCormack takes them, and their logic consequently teased out in a pretty straightforward and elementary manner, Bart has locked himself into an impossible position. In a later essay, Bruce McCormack wrote of Bart, God is so much the Lord that he is Lord even over his being and essence. The only thing that is absolutely necessary for God is existence itself. In his contribution to the recent essays edited by David Gibson and Daniel Strange, may be familiar to many of you, engaging with Bart, Paul Helm quite rightly exposes the insuperable difficulty attending this and surrounding statements, including those found in McCormack's original essay in the Cambridge Companion. Quoting Paul Helm, for is Bart positing a God who assigns himself a being or a character? Does this mean that God does not already have a character? God, on this scenario, is choosing his own essence. 
including Trinitarian essence. But who on earth or in heaven is this God who chooses his own essence? Paul Helm offers his response with a characteristic Pauline verve, and he seems to me entirely justified. Unless Bruce McCormack uh, is willing to admit that he and Barth, Bart misspoke to use Hillary Clinton language and plead that we should still ask whether Bart was onto something in his attempt to rethink the classical tradition on the relation of God's will to God's nature. Theological debates might then move on more fruitfully to discuss not what Bart did say, but what he wanted to say. Generally speaking, the debate over how to interpret Bart which is conducted by participants concerned about the substantive theological issues at stake and not just about interpreting Bart, is in danger of propelling us speculatively into a transcendent, imminently Trinitarian realm where we simply do not know, where we are not meant to tread, and where it is sometimes impossible to figure out even whether we are making sense or not. And that is, to put it, quite mildly. Throw an object high enough into space and it will never come down since it has exited the Earth's gravitational sphere. So it is, I venture to say, with much theological debate. The only spectacle worse than theologians kicking up the dust and complaining that they cannot see is theologians kicking up the dust and insisting that they do see. Now, lest you think that I'm being as grumpy today as I was self-pitying yesterday about systematic theologians, and thanks for that uh, reminder, Kevin, <laughs> let me uh, appeal to another party at this point. Theologians have often simply sailed past Brunner's warning about speculation in dogmatics. Although his position was set out in the prolegomena to the first volume of his dogmatics, Brunner's excursus on historical theology following a chapter on the Trinity in that same volume well sounds the warning note. Brunner was accused of denying the Trinity, but I think that this is a misunderstanding. Rather, he lamented the fact that belief in God as Father, Son, and Spirit, co-equally divine and one, is the starting point for speculation. That's what he lamented instead of its being a terminus, a confessional statement. Brunner may be prone to exaggeration. And while Birkhauer may himself be exaggerating a bit when he accuses Brunner of a tendency to play the fast and loose with exegesis, Brunner did sometimes seem to take exegetical shortcuts, which perhaps is not too different. Be that as it may, we should not sail past the warning even of a man who takes shortcuts on exegetical land. If we do, we cannot complain if we hit rough speculative seas which break up our craft, or if we end up navigating an ocean whose longitude and latitude is impossible to pinpoint precisely on any reliable theological map. We're going to have discussion time uh, afterwards, and please come back at me with these things. I mean, I, I think that I have a kind of bee in my bonnet about speculation. And... If you live in Northern Ireland long enough and you're a Welshman, you become doubly unbalanced. Unbalanced because you're Welsh. Unbalanced because you live in Northern Ireland as well on top of it. So come back at me and push me on this in case you think I'm just being uh, churlish and wrong-headed on this point. This is not implied that nothing can be said about the relation of nature and will in God. But we do not need to attempt theological adjudication on this score in order to get at the religious and theological core of Barth's doctrine of election. For it is not so hard to state what lies behind his ontological maneuvers. The line Bart runs is this. If God elected all, we can only surely know it if there is no hidden God. God's, if God's very self-constitution is for the sake of incarnation and universal election in Christ, Christ himself is the electing God and elected man. If that is the case, we have the strongest possible guarantee that the God who appears is the God who is. 
A sound gospel doctrine of election, this is Bart, of course, needs to be grounded in a sound doctrine of God. And it's superficial to do what I have done, which is to make accusations of unwarranted speculation. Now, we must quite decidedly credit Bart with not being interested in the theologically arcane for its own sake. Our criticism should not be too heavy-handed if the occupational hazard of the theologian turns out to lead Bart in a speculative direction as he seeks to clarify and test the church's proclamation by producing good dogmatics. His motivation is certainly plain enough here. He wants to affirm that God is truly known and that no hiddenness hinders our assurance and confidence. When we remember the context in which Bart wrote, including the legacy of post-enlightenment theology and culture, we should be grateful for his determined and reiterated insistence that God is truly known, although I shall qualify this support for him a little later. But however worthy Bart's motivation, it surely does not justify the path that he takes. Assume for a moment that God has elected all, and assume that we need to know it. The ontological move attributed to Bart in the direction of actualism is unnecessary to secure those positions. As far as we are concerned, all it would need for it to be the case that God had elected all would be for God to have willed it thus. That's all we need. As far as we are concerned, all it would need for us to know that he had elected us would be for it to be clear to us in his word. For our assurance, we should need to climb no higher, even if some theologians both thought that they were capable of doing so and were in fact capable of doing so. Reading Barth's discussion of election, we are constantly aware of the connection between his defense of the universal election in Jesus Christ and the question of knowing God. We might have substituted the phrase theological epistemology for the phrase, phrase the question of knowing God. But that would make it sound a rather abstractly academic issue, whereas Barth regards it as more or less a matter of life and death. In fact, prior to his hefty, explicit treatment of the doctrine of election in 2.2, Bart has described his position on the knowledge of God from 1.1 onwards, and nowhere more passionately than in the bitterest of all polemics in church dogmatics, or his whole authorship, as far as I can tell, for that matter, the polemic against natural theology. Both the references to election prior to 2.2 and the initial stages of the discussion in 2.2 alert us to the fact that in some respects we need to read Bart backwards. This is the case in two ways. It is true on the micro scale. Bart often takes up theological positions prior to his detailed exegetical discussions. And we have to resist the temptation to think that Bart has stitched up the issue before coming to scripture for he does eventually seek to ground his theological convictions unswervingly in biblical exegesis. It is also the case that we need to read him backwards on the macro scale, not just the micro. On the one hand, Barth feels bound to begin his church dogmatics by discussing the foundation of dogmatics in the word of God. On the other, he believes that this word has a determinate content and that we should not discuss theological method or biblical foundations unless under the control of that content. The content is essentially atonement. As Barthes, put it, Barthes puts it, atonement is the real center, not the systematic, but the actual center of dogmatics and church proclamation. But he does not treat this in its own right until volume four. Before that, and before getting to the doctrine of election, he has affirmed the centrality for Christian belief of universal reconciliation in Jesus Christ. He has explicitly announced the truth about election, which he will expound in 2.2. What Bart has effectively done is to assign to the doctrine of election what it characteristically assigned to atonement, namely universality. And vice versa, what is traditionally featured in the domain of election, namely the language of reprobation, 
has been transposed into the domain of atonement, where we learn that Christ is the reprobate one. This amounts to a studiously reformed neo-universalism. In introducing his specific discussion of election, Bart explains why he opts to treat election as part of the doctrine of God. It is not part of the doctrine of providence, for the providential ways of God are ordered to his electing purposes. So is creation. All is created in and through Jesus Christ, who is the electing God, as well as God's elect for us. Creation is thus treated subsequently to election, and that's in volume three. Election is part of the doctrine of God because it has to do with God's self-determination. God does not want to be God other than as the electing God. This is a primal decision made in God's own being. Election is first and foremost self-election. Election is a sovereign act, but it is a sovereign act of God's self-determining being, to be this God for us. It has been misunderstood, says Bart, of election. It has been misunderstood as the ordination of a private relationship between God and certain particular individuals. But it is first and foremost a determination to be God for us and God for us in Jesus Christ. Quote, when we utter the name of Jesus Christ, we really do speak the first and final word not only about the electing God, but also about the elected men. From here, Bart moves into the three main divisions of his exposition. Summarizes these very quickly. Much of this material would be familiar to some people here anyway. Main divisions of his exposition, the election of Jesus Christ, the election of the community, and the election of the individual. Aware of the unusual theological move that he makes, Barth concentrates his exposition of the election of Jesus Christ on an interpretation of John 1.1 1, 1, and on Jesus Christ as the word of God. Quote, the electing consists in this word and decree in the beginning. God has from all eternity ordained himself to be Jesus Christ. But the word is also that God, sorry, the word is also that God who ordains his own incarnation. Jesus Christ in person is the electing God. Despite the novelty involved, Bart professes puzzlement that this move has not been made before in the history of theology. Hermeneutical control rightfully ought to be in the hand of the Johannine text. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. For the word of God, he says, is the content of the Bible. The exegesis of these passages, Bart says, alluding to those which refer explicitly to election and predestination, the exegesis of those passages depends upon whether or not we have determined that our exposition should be true to the content, context in which they stand and are intended to be read. If Jesus Christ is not himself the electing God, who God is, he is unknown to us. He is a God behind Jesus Christ. We must know God as God is in Christ, as the electing God in Christ, ourselves as electing Christ. Quote, the substitution of the election of Jesus Christ for the decretum absolutum, the absolute decree, is the decisive point in the amendment of the doctrine of predestination. Positively and alternatively, as Bart is concerned, his own position, the eternal will of God in the election of Jesus Christ is his will to give himself for the sake of man as created by him and fallen from him. Christ then is elect and electing in divine self-determining self-election. Now, knowing that scripture usually speaks particularly rather than universally of election, Bart gives plenty of expository space to the election of the community and the individual. But election in these cases is not determination to life at the expense of those who are outside the number of the elect. In Christ, the elect are indeed elect to life, but there is also an election to service expressed in Israel and the church. In his little book, The Faith of the Church, Barth says, it seems to me that if we want to keep the new order of the New Testament, we must say, God has ordained and chosen them, that is the body and society of believers, into his temporal and eternal service, and consequently into everlasting life. 
This work, which consists of talks on the first part of Calvin's 1545 Catechism, Calvin's explanation of the Apostles' Creed, this work of Barth's, The Faith of the Church, has been adjudged a work where Barth comes especially close to Calvin. Yet in it, Barth criticizes Calvin on election for failing to appreciate that election is for service, leading on to eternal life, and not just to eternal life. In the very first half volume of Church Dogmatics, Barth had remarked that election concerned individuals in the New Testament, but not in the Old Testament. And the question of eternal life is not marginalized by Barth. Universal election does not mean no reprobation. On the contrary, atonement occurs through the judgment on the cross of the judge, judged in our place, Jesus Christ, who in bearing the curse of sin is the reprobate one. But as all are elect in this one man, so all were reprobate in this one man. Barth thinks that we are to keep open the question of whether or not this means the eschatological salvation of all individuals, that is, universalism. <clears throat> Barth argues this position over more than 500 dense pages with much small print and not a single picture. Draw them in the margins, the copies. Have you seen the new edition of Church Dogmatics? It's uh, 30, what is it, 31 volumes uh, out of Princeton, but, but slimmer, you'll be glad, as it were, to know than the original uh, TNT Clark Edinburgh volumes. And they've translated, in the new edition, they've translated uh, all the Latin and Greek. Uh, I don't think Bart quotes the Hebrew, does he? No, the Latin and Greek. Uh, well, if it's quoted, it's transliterated, the old dogmatics anyway. All that's translated for the benefit of uh, those who can't read Greek and Latin. Uh, there is no Welsh that I have found in this uh, new edition, so I have no time for it whatsoever. <laughs> so he argues this position over more than 500 pages with much small print. We seem to meet him in the full force of his personality at every point in Church Dogmatics, startling, startlingly omnipresent in the work of his hands. Despite any developments over the course of church dogmatics, there is a deep consistency. What we learn is central in 1.1. We are still hearing with the same accent in 4.4, which is where church dogmatics breaks off, and at all points in between. Surely anyone who exposes him or herself impartially to Bart will appreciate the power and insight which characterize his writing, even if this appreciation will be mingled with other sentiments. For does any other theologian have such a capacity for exasperating and enthralling, not only in terms, but even at the same time. Does any other theologian have that capacity? Except Brother Van Hooser here, of course. <laughs> I'm not serious. And if you give a summary of this lecture, don't say that. I was not serious. Above all, and this is a high commendation of any theologian, there is a persistent sense sustained throughout his work of the majesty, glory, sovereign greatness, and goodness of God, a God whose transcendence is never forgotten or eclipsed, even when Jesus Christ in the depths of his humiliation is also kept in sight as he constantly is. Admittedly, this degree of appreciation for Bart involves reading him ad meliorem partem, according to the best construction possible, that is, from the standpoint of the reader. As for Bart's Christocentric method, his own exemplification of it is its best commendation. His considerable ability and creativity as a theologian, anxious to ground his theology in biblical exposition, means that one can learn and profit a great deal from him. Assessment is quite demanding, as almost any objection we can think of is probably dealt with explicitly or implicitly somewhere in the corpus of his writing. It is tempting to say of Bart what someone said about America. No generalization about it is correct, but anything you can say about it is true about it somewhere. But you can see what's coming. Nevertheless, it seems to me that he is mistaken in his view of election. And as would be the case with anyone who can be commended along the lines that Bart may be commended, as I just have, it is most instructive to try to understand not only where, but why he has gone wrong. <clears throat> 
If a room is in darkness and we are permitted a single powerful overhead light to illuminate the whole as evenly as possible, it has to be angled very precisely. If it is not, it casts bright light on some areas but leaves the rest in comparative darkness and the whole is not well served. It appears to me that things are rather like that with Bart. At the heart of his exposition, there is an hermeneutical move. Election texts must be read in the context of the core of our Christian confession and of scripture, Jesus Christ, the word of God, Emmanuel, God with us and for us. This, quite apart from detailed exegesis of pertinent portions of scripture, makes it impossible to think in terms for Bart of a double decree here of two books written from eternity, a book of life and a book of doom. If that were the case, the book of life and the book of doom, Jesus Christ could not be the revelation of God. There will be more to God than is revealed here, viz. a will to condemn. And that would make the more in God not only a supplement, but an antithesis. The more than would be an other than the God and Jesus Christ who has loved us from eternity. But in fact, Jesus Christ is the decree of God. Now, this point is undeniable theological force. The question is whether the pursuant theological construction is sound. There are at least two reasons why the notion of universal election in Christ rings strange. And because these are familiar, I'm going to be fairly brief with them. The first is that it does not seem to square with the way that the language of election is used in Scripture, particularly the New Testament, which speaks of Christ. The second is that it points toward a destiny in universal salvation determined by God's active election and work in Christ. Now, mundane and familiar enough in Bart's criticism as this sounds, these are the things which rightly exercise those who ask less about his theological maneuvers than what emerges from them. It is what emerges which most directly affects the church. Let me be brief, and of course, uh, when you're brief like this, you, uh, you, you commit, in my experience, two uh, equal and opposite areas. When you're brief, you sound as if you're much more dogmatic on things that you want to be more relaxed on. Uh, you can also sound as if you're much more flexible on things that you actually want to be more dogmatic on. So let me state briefly, there are assumptions here, of course. Let me state these things quite briefly. It is true, of course, that Jesus Christ is called the elect in the New Testament. We are introduced to this from its very beginning in the book of Matthew. But he's not spoken of in terms of all being elect in him. And what is either implicit or explicit in the New Testament about election in Christ is captured in Paul's words to Timothy. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. The us being identified in Paul's later statement that he endures everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Jesus Christ with eternal glory. And the elect there is restricted. If we do believe that Jesus Christ was given for all, then we might think it unobjectionable to say that he's elect for all. But should we go down that path, we should obviously need at the very least to ask about the sense in which he's given for all. Then, given the characteristic biblical way of speaking about election, we should need to ask how exactly we execute the move to saying that he's elect for all, from the fact that he's given for all. Then again, whether it is one thing to say that he's elect for all and another that all are elect in him. A lot of inferential ground needs to be covered when our theological language is operating prima facie differently from biblical language. Or if not a lot of inferential ground, at least a very careful mapping on is required. Now, of course, Bart knows all this and as far as he's concerned, does all this. But what exactly is Bart doing? James Barr, in the concept of biblical theology, backs Nicholas Walterstorff when it comes to giving an account of what Bart is not doing. I think he's right and is a point that deserves to be highlighted. Picking up on observations made by Bart in 1-2 on biblical and dogmatic theology, James Barr remarks that there is and was in Bart's theology no place for the importance of a separate subject of biblical theology which could bring together the biblical material in a holistic synthesis. Bart, Barr goes on to say, clearly forbade attempting to make a dogmatic out of the totality of the biblical text. 
Now, the point being made there cannot simply be absorbed into a formal discussion about the relation of biblical to dogmatic theology. It is a question of whether, however we are defining them, Bart's way of distinguishing between them is allowing him to remold biblical concepts in a questionable way. Now, if we doubt the veracity or justice of Barr's characterization of Bart's principles, and this is a complex matter, Barr's nevertheless surely writes about Bart's practices. It is not those texts that proclaim that Christ is elect that most firmly ground Bart's argument at its very foundations. It is John 1.1. Now, John 1.1 is a text which falls far short of the determination of meaning that Bart ascribes to it in relation to election. Bart obviously knows that this is the case if we simply stare at the text itself. So his interpretation is offered in the context of a broader theological proposal. He pronounced himself puzzled by the failure of the church throughout its history to grasp the implications of John 1.1, although two or three, Athanasius is particularly notable, came close, Bart thinks. But surely it is Bart's puzzlement that is puzzling. If Bart simply declared that we should interpret election texts in scripture in their wider context, and in this way not give priority attention to those passages that speak of it, that might not be so puzzling whether or not we went along with him. What is strange is why Bart should think that what emerges in his account when he gives John 1.1 1, 1 this sort of role, has obviously more to commend it theologically for those who take seriously his high view of scripture than a more sober synthesis of the biblical materials which sticks closer to its theological language and internal theological use in scripture itself. For see what does emerge on Bart's account. I'll deliberately take examples from different parts of church dogmatics and from other works too. All are justified and all are sanctified in Christ. Our conversion to God took place in his death. That is the death of Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ affirms that which is actual in his death, the conversion of all men to God, which has taken place in him. The Holy Spirit is promised in Christ to all in this sense. Quote, and when there comes the hour of God, of the God who acts in Jesus Christ by the Holy Ghost, no aversion, rebellion, or resistance on the part of non-Christians will be strong enough to resist the fulfillment of the promise of the Spirit which is pronounced over them too. This means that, quote, we are no longer addressed and regarded by God as sinners who must pass under judgment for the guilt, as Bart puts it in Dogmatics and Outline. Because now, and this time I'm quoting from Learning Jesus Christ Through the Heidelberg Catechism by Bart, now it is only at this one place at this one place where God's wrath has burned as consuming fire, Golgotha, and it cannot so burn again. What God has done is to defeat us for, quote, we want to be in hell, but God has prevented that. Sin is an impossible possibility, and close to the same must be said of perdition as well. In faith, Bart says in Credo, we cannot reckon with man's persistence in unbelief with his being eternally lost and, and keeping up the, the, uh, the language of man as it's used in these translations. It is often said that Bart is not a dogmatic universalist, but that his scheme presses him towards it. And that's right. This is what Bart says. Even though theological consistency might seem to lead our thoughts and utterances most clearly in this direction, the direction of universalism, this is what he says in the course of his clearer statements on this matter. Even though theological consistency might lead there, we must not arrogate to ourselves that which can be given and received only as a gift. We can't tie God's hands in this matter of universalism. The following sentences puzzle me a little because Bart talks about our right of universalistic hope in these terms. Universalistic hope is there uh, in the presence of the supremely unexpected withdrawal of that final threat of perdition. Now, they're puzzled because in Bart's account, as he has just said, there should be nothing at all unexpected about that. It's what we should expect. How is he suddenly saying it will be a supremely unexpected withdrawal? I don't get it. My question is this. When, by your language, you upset the biblical balance between what is said about reconciliation in Christ on the one hand and faith on the other, 
and in upsetting it, also upset the balance of biblical statements and election, why should you be surprised that people do not see it your way? In all of church dogmatics, I believe that I'm correct to say Bart does not do anything with Acts 1348. When the Gentiles heard this, that's Paul's message, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. Bart does pick up that passage, but not that verse in 2.2. In 4.2, Barth says, for all men are ordained to eternal life. Now, quite apart from any material disagreement that we may have with Barth, does he not owe it to us to square theological statements such as those he makes here with biblical statements and not just attempt a coherent theological interpretation of the whole of Scripture? His accountability to biblical language is something which rather puzzled me, but, but, but it may be something I'm just not seeing here, and I'll be glad of any illumination you have to give on that. At the very least, I believe that Bart entirely fails to protect himself properly against this, the accusation that his kind of substitution of dogmatic for biblical theological language amounts to a material alteration of the content of the Christian doctrine as we should derive it from scripture. I do not ignore the need in any comprehensive assessment of Barth's achievement, to range much further than I have, including into Barth's Christology. I do not maintain that everything he says pivots on John 1.1. 1, 1. He makes a lot of John 1.14, the word became flesh. Above all, I'm not ignoring the theological issues to which he draws attention. What I am saying is that Barth seems untroubled by consistent dissonance between his own and biblical theological language. And this seems to be symptomatic of a theological construction which in practice takes priority over a, dare I say, more humble synthesis of biblical data. Bart moves along skillfully joined rational planks of theological construction, leaving exegetical awkwardness on the ground. Why? What Barth says about natural theology surely furnishes us with a clue. Barth fears and fights nothing like natural theology. Traditional Calvinist double predestination has nothing on this. Now, Barth does not, uh, that I have encountered, systematically distinguish between natural knowledge of God and the construction of a natural theology. I've not seen him systematically distinguish between those. Claim the one and you are headed for the other is probably the best way to summarize any implicit distinction he's making. For Bart to say that there is a natural knowledge of God is to resist grace. The whole business is heavily ironic. Advocates of natural knowledge, says Bart, believe that, and I quote him, what the Bible calls death is only sickness. What it calls darkness is simply twilight. What it calls incapability is merely weakness. What the Bible calls ignorance is only confusion. The grace of God which comes to men on the natural knowledge view of things does not really come to lost sinners. The irony is illustrated by mentioning Bronner again. Cited on this question as early as section one of paragraph two of the introduction of Church Dogmatics. Bronner, of course, is Barth's opponent in the famous debate over natural theology. Brunner's judgment on Barth's near universalism was that Barth's humans are like people who seem to be perishing in a stormy sea, but in reality they are not in a sea where one can drown, but in shallow water where it is impossible to drown, only they do not know it. For Barth, it is natural knowledge that plays down the human plight, the counter accusations and mirror images. But a case more significant than Brunner and far less well known is that of the Swiss Lutheran late 17th and early 18th century theologian Franz Budius. Barth was worried that Brunner's program was a repristination of that of Budius. And if you read Barth's Protestant theology of the 19th century and the relevant portion of Church Dogmatics 1 2 on Budius, you will surely find no greater villain in the history of theological thought. It was Budius who steered Protestant theology to the fatal point of launching a dogmatics with a positive discussion of the natural knowledge of God, 
which is what Buddhist uh, did in one of his dogmatics, his main dogmatic work. What does that mean? What does it mean if you launch your dogmatics with discussion of the natural knowledge of God? I'll tell you what it means, says Bart. It means that Jesus Christ is no longer accepted as our one and all, and we are secretly dissatisfied with his lordship and consolation. Faced with the need to exegete scripture after he's ruled out natural knowledge, in 2.1, Bart says it is a priori extremely improbable that a witness to God independent of his own revelation will be taught in scripture. Because natural knowledge cannot be a form of revelation at all. It's not a general revelation. It is the ominously realized dream of human reason. It comes up with another God, one whose action is not essential to him. I noticed at one stage that if you read Bart on natural knowledge of God or natural theology, every time he talks about natural knowledge, he talks about human achievement, human reason, all those things. I don't think he ever says that this is a form of revelation as people understand it to be. He does not believe it's a form of revelation, but he seems never to credit, I may be wrong here, but he seems never to credit those who advocate it with thinking that under the rubric of general revelation. He knows they do, but it's always human, 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 reason, reason, reason. That's the way he goes about things. Attacks on natural theology come up bang in the middle of Barth's discussion of election. Natural theology conjures up a God other than the God of Jesus Christ, other than Jesus Christ himself. That is the threat of threat in dogmatics preaching church life. It is a vast presumption. Moralistic works righteousness is both consequence and more radically, literally, the root of belief in nat natural knowledge. But at this point, in the opposition to works righteousness, where Barth so wholeheartedly appears to join company with the reformers, it is worth pausing. At first glance, Bart thoroughly adheres to the Reformation sola gratia and sola fides against works righteousness and does so for good Reformation reasons. At second glance, there seems to be a difference of emphasis. The reformers combated the self-righteousness of pride in justification by works, but also, as the Lutheran confessions make particularly clear, in, in combating justification by works, they were combating the problem of seeking something in a way which gave you incessant torment of conscience and despair. Try to justify yourself by works. It's not simply a matter of pride. Even worse than that, you will just torment yourself. Now, initially, Bart seems to be different here, where Luther pits grace and faith against self-doubt, though he does certainly pit them against pride as well, Bart pits grace and faith against self-confidence. That's the second glance. But at a third glance, and it is the last, the third glance is the last glance, no more glances. At third glance, after working through Bart and natural theology, I wonder if his problem is actually existentially close to Luther's after all. How can I find a gracious God? For at risk of the most unhealthy and presumptuous psychoanalysis, the virulence of Barth's attack on natural theology makes me wonder whether it is driven by fear. Natural theology will not yield a gracious God, and nothing must cloud our discovery of him in Jesus Christ. Consequently, does a kind of fear drive Barth's ontological Trinitarian exploration beyond what is really safe in order to find safety? I shall not try to defend a position of natural knowledge here more than I have on universalism. There are aspects of Barth's attack on natural theology with which we can surely sympathize, particularly when Brunner spoke of it as another task for theology in the dark decade of the 1930s when gospel resistance to Hitler was at stake. But Barth wanted, quote, a purifying of the church, not only from the concretely new point at issue in the 1930s, but from all natural theology. That's from 2.1. When all the distinctions are rightly made, some of us will want to affirm natural knowledge of God with the tradition, and certainly cannot regard it as massively damaging to do so. For those of us who think that way, sorry, for those of us who think that way, the question is, how did Barth get himself into the opposite situation to that of Brunner? Brunner, fearing dogmatic universalism much more than natural theology, Barth fearing natural theology much more than dogmatic universalism. Bart, 
describe theology as eine fröhliche Wissenschaft, a joyous science. He consciously echoed here Nietzsche's title of a book by that name. Nietzsche actually taught Barth's father, you know, in the sixth form of school. Church dogmatics is a song of joy. And in that respect, its mood offers a suggestive contrast with Calvin's Institutes. But the brief work that will best acquaint us with this characteristic of Barth's theological activity, the joyful, is his brief evangelical theology, very illuminating. Martin Rumscheid's address at the memorial service in the University of Toronto for Barth, published in fragments, grave and gay, gay there, of course, in the old sense of merry or happy, is also illuminating, not only for his emphasis on Barth's joyfulness, but for his identification of Barth's humor with a characteristically Basel humor. Humor and joy are not the same thing, but Rumscheid, with justification, associates them in Barth's theological enterprise. Now, for Barth, <clears throat> natural theology robs theology of joy. But my question is, and I'm drawing to a close here, Bar is Barth's a proportionately, uh, sorry, a properly proportionate joy? Does Barth not eclipse biblical tragedy? And does this not both drive his dismay at claims that God is naturally known outside the gospel and his positive doctrine of election? Bart loved Mozart. Yep, we got there finally. And was only half joking when in his preface to 3-4 he castigated his Dutch neo-Calvinist critics for disparaging Mozart. And he called them men of stupid, cold, and stony hearts to whom we need not listen. Burkhaub himself, by the way, redeemed the reputation of Dutch neo-Calvinists in Bart's sight somewhat. Mozart for Bart is the musician of joy. He did not ignore suffering, thought about death every day, but he took it all into his music and simply let creation sing as it should. Contrast Beethoven and Brahms, somber at best. And Bart would prefer that his church dogmatics were called a symphony instead of a song of joy, as I just called it. He would shudder the thought that we might threaten to tar his work with the brush of Beethoven, the illusion many will know, Beethoven's Song of Joy, in the uh, Ninth isn't it, Symphony. Bard on Mozart is a serious clue to his theology. After grazing a while in church dogmatics, it is impossible to read Bart's account of Mozart without realizing that Bart wants to emulate in dogmatics what Mozart, what Mozart achieves in music. Now, whether we can push this into a comparison of structure in Mozart's music and church dogmatics, I'm not sure. That's possibly what I was about a year ago thinking I might try to do, but uh, I, I would not do it competently anyway, though I was going to consult some people. I wasn't able to get very far with it. There's something there, though, I think. But is it possible to avoid the tragedy, even at the height of biblical eschatology, when God is publicly victorious? Reading the book of Revelation, it seems to me you cannot avoid tragedy. Eschatology is not bathed in unclouded light. In an essay on Schleimacher and Barth, Alan Torrance interpreted the connection between Barth's remarks about music and his theological optimism in terms of Barth's personal experience of life, at least to some extent. And Alan Torrance prescribed some Rachmaninoff for Barth posthumously. <laughs> along with more Beethoven and Brahms. Bart disliked tragedy. According to my old Dr. Walter Hans Frey, the tragic imagination was the one form of imagination for which Bart had little sympathy. Quoting from Frey, Titanism, he used to call it, depreciatingly, and wince whenever he saw it raising its classical or romanticized head. Now, biblical tragedy is not the same as classical or romanticized tragedy, romantic tragedy, material and technical distinctions. But it seems to me that that is a form of sensibility which Barth had little sympathy with as well, the, the biblical tragedy 
side of things. That perhaps is putting it on fairly strongly, but you see what I'm getting at. And at the end of a lecture where you feel like putting things a bit more strongly, it wakes people up and provokes them to discussion. In Fragments, Grave and Gay, and this is my last paragraph, in Fragments, Grave and Gay, Bart professes admiration for Kierkegaard but wants to go beyond him and to go beyond Kierkegaard into joy. I'm not going to defend Kierkegaard or endorse as it stands the sentence I'm about to quote from The Sickness Under Death. But this is a work which, in my judgment, reveals Kierkegaard to be far closer than Bart to the seriousness of scripture on sin. After talking about the relation of sin to atonement in terms diametrically contrary to those of Bart, Kierkegaard says, now I have spoken, declares God in heaven. We shall discuss it again in eternity. In the meantime, you can do what you want, for judgment is at hand. Granted the strength of Bart's contention about the discovery of universal mercy in Christ, is this, that is Kierkegaard's sentiment, not nearer the mark than Bart's understanding of the way that God has spoken in Christ the one universal word, yes, in election? Well, it's with fear and trembling one approaches these things, but it seems to me that Kierkegaard is closer. If in the first lecture, caution was suggested about deducing conclusions from the perfections of God, perhaps a lesson of Bart's work is that we must exercise a degree of caution also in deducing conclusions about election from Christological concentration in its Bartian form. But next, tomorrow, God willing, then a little on Monday, we must turn to the biblical materials themselves. Thank you for your patience. Calvin, when I last read through the Institutes, I've done it, I suppose, two or three times uh, in my life and obviously studied portions of it close up at different times. When I last read through the Institutes, uh, it struck me more forcibly than before, and here I may simply lack a historical sense, which I need to have more strongly, that it is a very turbulent work, that there was a lot of anger in it. I felt Calvin was angry a lot of the time. And by way of contrast, I felt Bart was joyous. I did feel that. Uh, psychoanalysis is, is, uh, is wrong, and uh, yet I find it hard to avoid here. I, I think there was a turbulence in Calvin over his notion of God. It's interesting that Calvin never in his institutes quotes the verse, the God is love. And when he does comment on that verse in his commentary on First uh, John, he's very, very wary of it. I mean. He says, look, this is accommodated language. This is how God appears to us. At the same time, there is a passage, and I, I'm sorry I can't uh, cite the exact passage at the moment in the Institutes, where Calvin says, you know, if you want to see where the attributes of God or perfections of God are best summed up, look at Psalm 145. And that's a wonderful psalm. The Lord is kind in all his ways, merciful in all his doings. His tender mercies are over all his works, however you want to translate those verses. Calvin, uh, Calvin does seem to me, in the end, to risk portraying in God the, um, the one whose love for the world is really dubious. That's how I find it in Calvin. I'll say a little bit more about that on t t Monday. But I find that Bart, on the other hand, uh, in his, uh, I don't mean to use this word emotively, but it comes to my mind, his flirtation with universalism. I find there's a great danger there of neglecting biblical data. So I find myself, uh, Kevin, actually wanting to find some ground between Bart and Calvin here. I think it is available. Uh, so is that, a, is that a woolly answer or is that adequate for now? The, the Divine Comedy, um, I don't know what to say about that, that really. Are you asking about, about the technical uh, connotations of comedy in, in Dante? Because I'm not 
well up enough on medieval yeah, Renaissance art. I find that the, the scriptures leave us with a story not yet completed, particularly in the book of Revelation. And in that book, there is triumph and joy, but there is also a shadow. Uh, let the uh, one who is evil go on doing evil. Share the right of the tree of life taken away from some people. So I would want to reflect, I think, in my theology, um, the whole balance of scripture, I know we all would, but I think, I think Revelation prohibits us um, either from emphasizing darkness and tragedy as the main element, or from emphasizing unclouded joy either. I think there's an eschatological resolution to these things which we cannot yet see. Just as right now there is tragedy in the world with evil, so we are left with the shadow somehow in Revelation, how God will deal and eliminate with it. The question of how it is that within God's being his will and his nature are related is a question which we can explore to some limited extent, I think, but it is terribly, terribly limited. Why do we need it? Here I have a luminous relation in the person of the Son who speaks the words of God because he is the word of God. I do not need to know how God is constituted in his inner being. I do not need to know whether God could have done X, Y, Z, any of those things. I simply need to know him in his person and character in Christ as gloriously light, love, entirely holy and just. And I need to try to do his will. I don't think I need to go beyond that, no.